It's a privilege to actually come and talk about the most neglected aspect of the neglected diseases. It's a timely topic in terms of the fact that two weeks ago in Washington there was a World Bank WHO summit addressing the topic of mental health, particularly in the middle and low income countries. And I'm going to give you some figures because a colleague who has worked with me for many years, Bernard Lisa, who's now at Georgetown University and used to be at the World Bank, produced some results of an analysis of the amount of official development assistance that went into neglected tropical diseases as a proportion of overseas development assistance for health. And it was 0.6%, and that figured in the Lancet series we published in 2010. Bernard has since then looked at the amount of money that goes into global mental, global mental health in its totality, and that figure is 0.3%. Now, that background, and this is a picture of people with NTDs, and you'll see, I hope here, the impact of disability, stigma, deformity, blindness on issues related to the life of sufferers. And this summary, you can take away and it's been published, reflects the burden which will impact on the mental health status of individuals, families, communities, and an important group, the caregivers. Now, if and we came to this some three or four years ago, recognizing the elements in the previous slide, but then looking at the then current WHO statement on mental health and development, targeting people with conditions uh, mental health conditions as a vulnerable group. And taking the executive summary of that, the bullet points which emerged from that executive summary are summarized on the right of this slide. For me, they all reflect the problems that sufferers from NTDs have. Stigma and discrimination, physical and sexual abuse, restrictions on rights, inability to fully participate in society, unable to access essential health care, barriers to education and employment, perhaps premature uh, death and long-term disability. That was from a mental health document that never mentioned NTDs at all. If you look at the Global Burden of Disease Studies, just look at the projected where am I? Oh, golly, sorry, Marianne, I've done something horrible. Press the wrong button. Get me out of here. Um, the slide shows, or will show, the change in global burden of disease from 2004 to 2030. Let me press the right button. Okay? And depressive disorders move from number three in ranking to number one. Of all mental health disability in low middle income countries, unipolar depressive disorders are the number one cause of global, global morbidity. This is from the Lancet studies on disability, years of life lived with disability, which is part of course of the DALI calculation. And what you see here is this big red block which if you look at the legend here, are mental and behavioral disorders. So that is the global burden of mental health disability. Of that burden, 40% is depressive disorders in the blue here. This is years of life lost. We are not saying that of that element of the DALI calculation, the, is any death associated with depressive disorders and NTDs. That may not be true because we know there are suicidal ideations in some conditions like leprosy 
and filariasis. We came to this through a student of mine and a research assistant, Liz Litt and Maggie Baker, and we published this review in Trends in Parastology some three years ago. And the caption, the slide here, is a Van Gogh self-portrait. We know Van Gogh himself committed suicide, but that's one of the iconic images of depressive illness that exists in the art world. But we also came to it because we were working on filariasis. My colleagues here, Sarah and, and Haley, do this on a regular basis, working in Malawi and Ethiopia. These are actual statements by filariasis patients. My parents have bought me two suitors, but neither decided to marry me. This one, a student of mine, tragically passed away, Dominic Keelem. I was there when she said this in Burkina Faso. Before she had any lymphedema treatment, she couldn't walk to market. But the fact she then had some lymphedema treatment was critical to her ability to socialize and become respected again within her community. So her ability to walk a distance to market was critical. And I think the studies that my colleagues have done in Malawi show that very important point. Mobility in this condition, and I suspect Gail will talk about it in podoconiosis, is absolutely critical to a fulfilling uh, life and an engagement with the community. Last year, with a health economist from uh, the US, Tan Ton, myself and Charles McKendy published this article on the burden of mental illness in lymphatic filariasis, largely because we had some figures upon which we could base a calculation. And Tan Ton did the modeling of the calculation, but the question was, what is the global burden of depression associated with lymphatic filariasis? And, and we had to use the literature, as you do, and there were a few studies on lymphatic filariasis which registered the prevalence of depression in various communities, and they're highlighted here. A very high level in patients in India, in Kerala, less in Togo, 30-odd, 40% in Haiti, very low numbers of people showing depressive illness in Sri Lanka. However, when you sum all these things together, we decided to make a calculation based on a 50% prevalence of depressive illness in people who, in the 18 million who have symptoms severe enough to cause depression, and that was based on uh, Kappa Ramaya and Eric Otterson's uh, calculations in 2014 of the impact of the Global Filariasis Program. When the Global Filariasis Program started in 2000, the numbers of people who were estimated to have the disease was around 140 million, and it was then stated by WHO that it was the world's second cause of disability. Nobody knew what the first one was, but the point was that it was high in the list of, of, of conditions that was causing disability. When you look at the Global Burden of Disease Studies 2010, published in 2012, the numbers of DALIs attributed to filariasis is 2.78 million. Okay, there are some confidence limits there, but that's the number. But this is based on a disability weight of 0.1. So if you've got bilateral lymphedema or you've got gross hybrosil, the disability weight is only 0.1, not very high. But what we did then was to take some of these figures and on the basis of the depressing prevalence that we found from the literature, we said, of that 18 million, let's assume 10 million have mild depression, 7 million have moderate depression, and 1 million have severe depression. Out of the 18 million, we know suffer from filariasis symptoms. And the figure that we came out with, using the disability weights from the mental health literature, not from the filariasis literature, from the mental health literature, Note that moderate, mild depression has a disability weight higher, 0 0.05 higher, than filariasis itself, of 0 
0.4 for moderate depression, 0.655 for severe depression. That figure, which emerges as the burden of galleys for depressive illness alone in filariasis, is nearly twice as high as what the global burden of disease estimate was for filariasis itself based on physical pathology. Now, these are iconic photographs. The child leading a blind person used to be extremely common throughout West Africa. Um, blinding Onko, this was taken in a place called Ajubendi in Ghana. This is a picture I took myself in Tanzania, in Zanzibar. No, sorry, Mafia Island. And this woman said, my family has to take care of me when the fevers come, probably once a month. So those two images reflect caregiving. If you do a literature search on caregiving and neglected tropical diseases, you find nothing. We have information in the literature, quite a lot of information, about caregivers in HIV, in chronic neurological disease like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, but we have nothing in the area of NTDs. The nearest we can find is a paper by Braish in ophthalmology, the burden of depression in caregivers of blind patients in India, which we took as a, as a model. And the prevalence of depression in that group, and there was a greater degree of depression in the caregivers related to the degree of visual impairment of the patient they were looking after, was about 48%. But that has to be matched by, and medics in the audience will know, a broad level of depression of around 15% prevalence in the general population. Notwithstanding that, if you start working out, and we used filariasis as again an example, we calculated that for caregivers of people who had chronic filariasis, the numbers of DALIs attributable to mental illness in caregivers was about 220,000. Now, let's look at the impact that some of these diseases have and the implications of that. This is a paper from PLOS NTDs by De Zuy on the participation of patients with Beruli ulcer in Benin. And if you go down this list, um, and this is the level, the, the, the orange bars are the, the patients and the grey bars are the controls, and this is a percentage of restriction in participation in various activities. And what you see is that the patients really are restricted in many ways. Work, can't work as hard, can't find work, can't contribute economically, can't visit outside the village, coming back to the walking in the case of filariasis, can't participate in major festivals. These are activities which are deprived for people with these conditions and contribute, obviously, to the, the mental health status of the individual. I've listed here the diseases which, for me, are those which disable and stigmatize and so on. And they're fairly self-evident. Beruli ulcer, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis and cutaneous leishmaniasis, etc. The ones at the bottom, leprosy, obviously, yours, African trypanosomiasis because of the sequelae of neurological disease post-treatment, uh, cystosychosis, toxoplasmosis, and podoconiosis. That is not deliberately left off or cut in half, Gail. Um, the point is, I want you to just think of a, one of these, cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. Why I want you to think about it? Well, first of all, because of the global incidence. 1.3-ish million new cases a year. Why? Those are people who are going to be permanently disfigured, sometimes facially so they can't attract uh, partners. Um, and as a result, if you start working out what that might mean in terms of depressive illness, that is a very long time lived with a disability because cutaneous leishmaniasis has no impact on mortality. So we are talking about a huge global burden. 
In February, De Vlas and Wilma Stolt from Rotterdam published a paper in PLOS NTDs. And it was called The Global Health Impact of the uh, Achievement, essentially, of the 2012 Goals for NTDs. They calculated that if the NTD programs were effective over that period, 600 million DALIs would be averted. One of the limitations of the study, which they say, and quote, was we didn't include any information on the burden of mental health. And given the figures that I've given you from these diseases, one is going to say, well, how many DALIs would be averted if you started to include mental illness of these diseases? And finally, that paper showed that in terms of the DALI uh, burden, the preventive chemotherapy diseases were contributing most to the DALI burden uh, of um, disability, whereas the deaths, years of life lost, were coming from the IDM diseases, which is not surprising because they tend to be fatal, like visceral leishmaniasis or sleeping sickness and so on. So that's the story. We have a neglected set of diseases. We have an element of their burden which is absolutely neglected. The only study that I'm aware of is the one we've done in filariasis. The plea I make is actually, if we're to advocate for NTDs, we need to take on board this massive burden of mental illness which is out there, and in addition to the patients, also the caregivers, whose life is also disrupted. In the case of the children, they can't go to school, so they miss out on educational uh, opportunities, etc. So here we have, for me, an area which really has got to be addressed. There are certainly movements, as Julian Eaton will um, describe, by the NGO networks to address this. But I think we have a platform, and I believe we should have a momentum, because if we're to seriously address these diseases, we actually should be looking at the long-term uh, impact on patients and their overall health, not just their physical uh, disabilities. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, I look forward to hearing from you later. <laughs>